case now that's the case <laughs> and um oh sorry i'm just gonna go back for one second um because we're being streamed please do not share any confidential information and also uh, a kind request to please close YouTube while you participate in this session, because it could interfere with the sound and YouTube is always a little bit lagging behind the real action on Zoom. Um, if you want to ask questions, um, please make sure in the participants list that your name is showing and you can use the chat uh, to ask questions and at the end of the session we'll have a, a kind of discussion then you can also raise your hand and then we can get to the floor. So um, the full title of this session is how can NPA projects support the uptake of advanced technologies for the benefits of digitization and enhance sustainable growth and competitiveness of SMEs. And these are, this is quite a wide theme, and this corresponds to some of the aspects of the new uh, innovation priority in the new program. Um, so first I will highlight some of the projects that we have already funded as a program uh, in this wide theme. Uh, and then we'll hear a little bit about uh, the distinct project context. Um, uh, Ulf will, will give a presentation about the initial findings from the distinct project uh, in relation to uh, some of the challenges and opportunities for the adoption of disruptive technologies in public service provision in the NPA area. Um, then we will have um, a session to show the possibilities that virtual reality technologies can offer for uh, the capacity and technology knowledge of SMEs and public service providers and uh, also enhance collaborative and education uh, environments. And that will be a presentation by Jose Manuel and uh, Leah Ryan from Ernect. And at the end of the session, we'll have some time for a discussion. Oh, I'm going far too quick on this. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so the, what has the NPA already funded? Uh, so the, the theme corresponds to the current programs uh, Priority one, where we have a specific objective dealing with um, giving SMEs access to R&D. And we have a specific objective focused on uh, innovation and public service provision. Then we also have uh, an entrepreneurship priority, priority two, where part of it will be, uh, is focused on SME support more in general and um, making use of place-based opportunities. And the second specific objective focuses on how to give uh, SMEs a greater market reach. So a bit more about the, the projects uh, in specific objective one one for the current program. And you can see uh, the types of projects we've already supported. So for example, Target uh, developed an innovation support toolkit for the manufacturing industries. Um, the free project uh, supported SMEs to move from pioneering to market in environmentally uh, friendly products and services. Um, the serial SW Grow and Urchin projects, they focus on increasing the value of biological resources through innovation. Um, then we had a number of projects focused on uh, uh, seafood, um, how to get them in a better way from uh, the producers to the consumers uh, with smart fish focusing on smart labeling and disrupt aqua focusing on blockchain technology. And uh, we also have a circular economy project Symbioma using uh, biomass from food and beverage industries uh, as uh, for new uses basically. Uh, so we have uh, different types of projects um, that focus on getting R&D support for SMEs and also technology transfer to or across the program area and also innovation in uh, green, uh, the green economy and the blue economy. Then uh, when it comes to uh, innovation projects in the public service provision, we have um, 
different types of did we presented this slightly differently so um we have a lot of projects dealing with um health care uh, also well-being and elderly care and a number of projects that focus more on the IT solutions uh, more in general. And then we have the Spire project just hanging a little bit on the outside. It had many aspects also to do with remote technology and also to do with um, uh, providing more green uh, transport. Then focusing on uh, priority two, um, there we have a number of projects that improve the support system for SMEs that you can see on the screen. So. Um, Promoting entrepreneurship, especially among specific uh, target groups, such, such as young people, uh, women, uh, very remote uh, communities, and also green uh, business development. And then um, we had also different types of business models and making use of uh, place-based opportunities. Um, so the types of projects that we have here is really removing barriers for entrepreneurship, encouraging entrepreneurship and also the, the place-based opportunities, as I mentioned. And then in specific about Detective 2.2, uh, we have a number of projects um, that are focused on innovating the tourism industry and really developing new models for more sustainable tourism. As we could see earlier, uh, the, the project uh, video for Spotlit uh, was one example of this. And then we have a number of projects um, that are focused on capacity building and upskilling up uh, and making use of the new digital opportunities. And they're listed there as well. So we have uh, new marketing models, um, also projects um, taking advantage of the clustering and, and networking effect of transnational cooperation and uh, projects making use of uh, distance planning technologies. And finally, we have uh, two quite new projects, uh, two clustering projects that we um, have uh, recently funded uh, back in June. So they're really in the startup phase. Um, the first one, Caddyshack, uh, digital innovation to enhance the market reach of SMEs. It's, it's sort of a, a clustering of four. Um, already funded NPA projects and it's focused on immersive technologies, digital marketing, data anal analytics and place-based approaches to promote a natural and cultural heritage. And then the other project, eTrack, ethical tourism re recovery in Arctic communities is also uh, focused or based on four different uh, NPA projects that we already funded. And the idea here is to enable short-term business recovery while also exploring options for a more culturally and locally um, sensitive tourism future. So these are some of the, the newest projects trying to capitalize on what has been funded before. And I would suggest that you follow these closely as well. So these are some of the um, projects that I wanted to highlight. Um, and I would now like to hand over to the moderator for the rest of this session, Jose Manuel from the uh, Distinct Project and many other projects, in fact. Um, please um, take over and, and uh, make us ready for the next part of the session. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Happy to see this group here. Actually, I see some people and some connections. I think the, the important part of this session probably is the, the latest part that is the discussion. I hope that we can manage the time to have enough time for discussion because I see, for example, apart from the distinct partners, I also see partners from the tested project. We have uh, yeah, Joan, Alan, and, and leaders and other people. So I want to invite people to, to be active and, and, to, and to interact. So Let's move into the into the agenda, and I want to give the floor to my to my colleague uh, Ulf Hedestick, uh, that is one of the of the partners of the of the distinct project. The distinct project we are Erna leading the project, the UMA University that Ulf belongs to, and we also have uh, the Carilla University of Applied Sciences that I also know that they are participating in this workshop. Ulf is going to show you uh, the main findings we have. Uh, 
got from the first part of the project where we made a foresight analysis to, to check what are the uh, what is the what are the main challenges or what is the situation or why uh, public uh, services uh, public service sector uh, what are the challenges for them to implement disruptive technologies and on the other side we wanted to map the the supply capacity that we have in the northern periphery in Arctic uh, in terms of this type of technologies so maybe Ulf uh, instead of giving you the floor I give you the screen <laughs> okay <laughs> Thank you, Jose. I hope you will see my slides here. Um, as uh, Jose said, uh, I belong to Umeå University in Sweden, and I, I see uh, most of the, the partners in, in uh, the distinct project is uh, participating in the in the, the this uh, session. So if you have questions, you 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 certainly will get the answer from uh, some of of us. Uh, the the distinct uh, have had a, an approach with uh, four work packages. So they have conducted a foresight analysis within the areas of health and social care, training and education, and uh, env environmental. Uh, services and managers and and the foresight analysis is based on interviews and questionnaires so we have uh, conducted both uh, um, methods in in our capture of the data uh, we have also ma mapped the capacity uh, within the npa region in regarding to these uh, disruptive technologies that we have been concentrated on. And, and that has been uh, virtual reality, IoT, II, or blo blockchains. Um, we have also uh, uh, connected uh, to, to the findings. Uh, we are um, uh, later on uh, um, uh, producing some seminars, uh, workshops where we are uh, demonstrating some of the best practice of the usage of these disruptive technologies. And then I'm coming back to the times and the dates for these uh, seminars. And, and the last part of the, the distinct project is that we will uh, conduct a, a roadmap for implementation of disruptive technologies. Uh, the foresight analysis was uh, based on 45 responses from the MPA region and, and two thirds of the, the answer we got was coming from local agencies or local municipalities and governments. And uh, the, um, the more regional and public sector was uh, the next one in, in size. So they had 13% uh, each. Um, the findings if you it will be short because i have not so many minutes to present the findings is that uh, many of the disruptive technologies are rather new so so there is uh, from many uh, public authorities uh, a lack of awareness of the solutions and its potential potential application within their uh, um, organization so they know a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence, but they can't see the, 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 the usage yet. Uh, they see also the requirement of uh, having new skills in these new areas. Uh, and, and we can see the difference between some of the technologies that have become more mature, for instance, IoT is becoming more and more mature. So there, there you have already in the public sector uh, many examples of implementations. Time is also a constraint since uh, many of them is working full time with uh, business development or uh, other issues, but the time to experiment and make some exploration of disruptive technology, that's a problem. So, so uh, getting time for doing that is, is uh, problematic, especially in local governments. And also, you, usually when we come to the local government, they, they don't have a, a funding for doing these kind of experiments or trying to implement uh, advanced technologies. 
the mapping capacities that we have uh, conducted uh, uh, um, uh, investigation of SMEs and organizations that has in some way uh, tried to develop uh, solutions uh, in regard to these kind of disruptive technologies. And the result from our uh, investigation was that we, we mapped 22 organizations in six MPI countries. And from there, we have had uh, uh, 37 examples of uh, applications. And the, the examples of uh, the, the uh, application differs from uh, within different technologies. And we can see that IoT and virtual reality is much more mature. Uh, where we can see that exists uh, 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 application in use. But uh, when we come to blockchain or artificial intelligence, uh, it's more difficult to see that there exists solution today, especially in these regions. Uh, we will conduct, uh, based on these findings, uh, three seminars uh, during the fall. And uh, the first one will be rather soon, the 16th of November. And then we will con concentrate on uh, env uh, environmental services and management, and hopefully give some examples of uh, how uh, different organizations ha have used uh, uh, disruptive technologies uh, within the uh, environment. 7th of December, we will have a, a seminar connected to a, a healthcare area. So we have a similar one there with the disruptive te technology, but then in, in uh, healthcare and social care. And the 25th of January, we will uh, conduct uh, the last seminar and it's connected to how we can use uh, uh, disruptive technologies in training and, and education. So uh, hopefully if you want to get more information of the reports from the findings, you will find it uh, in the following uh, uh, website. And with that, I will stop and give the floor back to Jose. Thank you, Ulf. Uh, I know it was challenging uh, in five minutes, try to, to summarize everything. Yeah, but, but I think uh, you, you gave a, a, good, uh, a good summary of the situation in terms of the application of these potential disruptive technologies into the public sector. As Ulf was mentioning, we are having those series where we have called Disruptive Tuesdays. But today, since we, we are here, we wanted just to show a couple of small examples uh, that we are developing at, at ERNAC uh, using a type of uh, virtual reality solutions that can be applied uh, and can have uh, good potential for the public sector. Uh, my colleague, uh, Leah Ryan, is going to show you um, an example that we are using at the moment targeting SMEs in order then to have access to technologies and in order to have access to knowledge that maybe is non existing in that area. So this is a solution for distance spanning uh, so as a distance spanning solution. And then I will play a video where you will see a virtual reality, uh, a virtual reality version of my colleague Maisa. Uh, that you will see that uh, we are using or we are experimenting also with some virtual reality uh, collaboration environments that also have a, a potential not only for the industry but also for the public sector. But I maybe hand over now to, to my colleague Leah that is going to show you uh, about those uh, virtual tools that can help to, to access to, to technology and solutions. Leah. Thanks, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hey, um, so today I'll be showing you two examples that we've previously recorded here at Ernak. So as Jose has already mentioned, um, these, the two 360 tours have been done for a project that we are running here in Ireland, which provides SMEs with innovation and technologies. So based upon this approach, we can see the similar potential 360 virtual tours will have for the distinct project. So firstly here, we will look at the Wiser Lab here in Letterkenny, which is in the Co-Lab. 
So as you can see, this 360 tour is, um, it's very similar to Google Street View. We can move around the room and also jump from room to room. So it's a very beneficial tool. It's all very clear. And these eye tags have been, um, these eye tags draw attention to particular machinery that the lab or workshop manager would like to showcase. So as we can see, all the machinery is labeled and it's very easy to move around and see. So on these eye, the information tags here, we can input um, information in the form of text or pictures, um, links, YouTube videos. And for example, here we have a link, which further explains the different equipment and how it could be used. And as well, different videos. So we can move around the room from different angles and see everything that's available. So we can see the possibility for VR technologies to be used in the public sector and services. For example, the county or the councils could use this 360 virtual tool to show facilities. Um, for example, in the housing sector, the VR could showcase houses which are in construction to potential tenants. So the second demonstration I'd like to show you is this is the Design Centre in the Northwest Regional College in Limavady. So again, similar to the last one, we can move around the workshop. We can move from room to room. Again, very similar to Google Street View. It's very easy and it was very quick to put this together. It took all about half an hour to make. So we can move around. Again, the eye tags drawn our attention to the different machinery. Here we can see we have images and text explaining how it can be used. It was actually here I was speaking to a man who'd said that um, the VR technologies have, have been a great advantage for them. It's a very, I suppose, a long process taking potential clients and showing them around, showing them particular equipment which could, which could work for them. So um, I suppose the, the virtual tour is a very time efficient tool, both for the lab workshop or in this case, the public sector and for their clients. So again, I suppose another example of how VR technologies could be used by the public sector is in the tourism industry. So tourist attractions, I suppose, which aren't accessible could be made accessible via virtual reality. So if you have any other ideas of how this could be used, it would be great to hear. So thank you for listening. I hope you have found this interesting. Thank you, Leah. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Again, I, I think uh, this is applied to, to targeting uh, uh, targeting companies, but the same way that can be the companies can be targeted, uh, the, the public sector, the civil servants can also be the, the target group that could benefit of this type of solutions. The second one going very quickly, because again, I think the most important part is the, the discussion we might have. I'm going to share uh, a video with you. Um, that uh, will show you um, one virtual reality environment that we are starting or we have already tested in some in some ERNAC meetings and, and in some projects. Again, um, this is a solution that uh, can go beyond of the of the normal uh, Zoom or team meetings and have the potential uh, for the organizations using it to uh, to get the benefits of a more immersive environment. Do you see this? Hello. Welcome to ERNAC Virtual Space, yeah. a 3D immersive workspace that gives the attendees all the benefits of a live meetings, but without travel or physical contact. My name is Maisha and today I'll be your host in this demo, so let's do it! When you arrive to the ERNAC virtual space, you are represented by an avatar in the middle of the screen, where you will be able to customize and choose your avatar's look and style. To talk, click the microphone button in the lower left corner to turn on your mic.
When finish, click the button again to mute yourself. There is also a text chat option which allows you to share message with other users. In this space, you'll experience a specialized voice, which means you can hear people close to you talking and their voices fade as they walk in a different direction. In some areas, you may see a blue rectangle or cycle on the ground. This is a private sound area which only the people within that space can hear each other, allowing for more private conversations. As a presenter, you have the ability to use a laser pointer to emphasize a section of your presentation. Also, depending on the needs of the meeting, we can change the desk configuration that is best for that meeting. Okay, this, this is just a, a quick example about this type of environments. The, the thing is that, of course, you see the two dimension version of this, but if you have uh, uh, virtual reality headsets, of course, you, you have the full immersive, um, the full immersive uh, experience. And this has also a lot of possibilities for, for all the users, in, of course, the, the public sector. I also know that, for example, uh, one of our partners in the Emergreen project, the University of Galway, they were providing this the first lecture in, in Ireland in a full virtual reality environment. I also know from Alan Whiteside that he's also here from Edify in Scotland that they are using this type of environments for training. So today we only wanted to, to, to bring this into, into, the, into this presentation to just to have a sort of a flavor of what, what can be possible. Um, but now I think we have about 10, 15 minutes for discussion, Kirsty. So I hand yes. over to you. I will start with a call question, actually, um, on Slido, just to get uh, us talking to each other. So I will share my screen. One second. So you can join us on Slido here, and I also We'll paste the link in the chat. There you go. And once we have that, um, I think we can move to the first poll. One second. <laughs> Sorry, I need to share, switch screens a little bit. Um, We go and share this. So the first question is what type of organization do you belong to? So if you would like to access the link go to Slido and type in the hashtag 20th of October 2021, then you could answer the Slido poll. I don't see any reactions yet. Yeah, it would be good to have this type of input just for the discussion or yes. to have to, if, if, it's, if it's possible. I mean, yeah, if the attendees can, can reply to this, uh, otherwise we can we can have the discussion anyway, but uh, it would be good if we can have this initial yes. feedback just to direct a little bit or, or to elaborate a little bit on the discussion if possible. We have 25 participants in the, in the group, so hopefully if there's any technical issues accessing the slide, then please let me know. Uh, 
Okay, he says she has responded. Maybe that's, aha, sorry, I needed to click on a button. <laughs> <laughs> It was told that this would be automatic. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So a lot of you are regional authorities and universities. Very good. I have, I have a question to Jose. Since you had these examples, uh, uh, it, it's quite uh, uh, interesting to hear if you in in uh, in uh, letter can if you are first or Facebook first because for, for Facebook are changing their name and they put, talk about the verge and the, the metaverse which is quite similar to the, the second example you showed about the three dimensional uh, uh, context. <laughs> No, well, in this in this case, in, in the particular case of that that video that we have shown is this this is because we were in another project with a partner that is very experienced. She's in another program, a partner from France, and it was a platform that they were using for a virtual reality fair. So we went for that solution on the basis of our okay. uh, actual uh, our, our connection with that with that partner. Uh, but maybe we can start a business with, with Facebook as well, you know? Uh, I, but because it's interesting to see how they are shifting their, their, their business model and, and, and goes more to, to the, this kind of environment that you was showing. So, so I, I think all the big players are moving into these environments. LBR, I think, is a solution from Microsoft as well. And they are all, all, all of them are making these moves, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could say, see that we also have a question coming through on Slido. So I'm just going to share my screen once more. So uh, does the audience think it would be useful to introduce more demonstration activities into work plans to show disruptive technology in action? Does anybody want to comment on that? And if so, Please raise your hands. Oh, I see other questions coming up. Very good. Depends so you what you mean by those. Oh, sorry. Then go ahead. Please leave. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> I was just. It depends what you mean by by demonstrate. Um, because it, I mean I've worked for the NHS and we get approached um a, with a lot of um disruptive technologies and trying to you know demonstrate and, and implement those within the health service it's, it's not it's not an easy thing to do so it depends what how much level of demonstration is it an example of what you could do or here's a real world kind of um you know test of it they're both useful but it's just that one's a lot more work than the other <laughs> does the person who asked the question maybe if they're in the, the Zoom session, would they care to maybe explain a bit more what they mean with demonstrates? Uh, at our, in the, in the distinct pro, pro, project where we ha have the demonstration, I think that many of the examples we will uh, demonstrate is actually in use. So, so uh, uh, we will provide with examples, both in healthcare and, and especially in the environment management, examples of how different local governments have used uh, different tools to, to, to solve problems by using disruptive technologies. So it's not just a demonstration of what you can do with technology because it's usually, very difficult to, to interpret into the, your own context. So, so uh, it's uh, like, like the question, it's much more useful if you can see some good examples in practice, how, how it can be used, because uh, it's very easy to show the, 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 the technology the per se, but, but uh, many people want to see and ask people also that have used it, what, uh, what is the pros and cons with it? Yeah, it's not just about the technology working, it's about does it actually address a need that that organisation has and also, you know, implementing new things into healthcare services is quite a lengthy process. Um, so I think you're maybe thinking more of like a test bedding something rather than 
system-wide change because that wouldn't probably happen within the duration of a project I wouldn't think. Especially in healthcare you have so many legacy problems with the old systems and if you you try to develop uh, solutions based on artificial intelligence then then you have to provide some totally new systems or uh, um, or, or uh, the basic technology you have, you have to change. So, so, so you have to do some kind of dramatically changes if you want to use uh, certain kinds of technology. So, so uh, uh, that's a, a main problem. So that therefore you perhaps not see so much of the, the usage in practice because you, you, you need uh, the redesigning your infrastructure in some way. And that, that's that's a big, big thing. And yeah. it really has to clearly demonstrate that it is, you know, improving health care or improving access to care uh, um, or, or, you know, it has to have a clear, um, you know, a clear benefit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because uh, you, you have to look at the, Sometimes I have seen, especially in, in, in the healthcare area, that we have tested the sophisticated solutions. And it's usually not that that is the main problems. The, the, the problems can be that you, you can't get the signal from the Bluetooth equipment to the 4G G or something like that. And that mm -hmm. makes it impossible to use in practice because uh, you have to stick with a, a stable infrastructure in the communication and and uh, some parts of the northern Sweden we haven't uh, connection enough for uh, providing uh, solutions based on disruptive technology due to that uh, infrastructure the in infrastructure is in uh, on place. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm conscious of the time, and I see a couple of virtual hands up. I think first you. Colin and then Alan, if you, I would like to also yeah, to get inputs from other attendees. So please, if you can raise your hand to intervene. I think Colin, you were first. Then we go to yeah. Alan and of course to the others that way if you want to, to comment. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to confess, Sozi, that it was me who asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I didn't realize that it was it would come up anonymous, but it, it was me. Um, and, and the reason I, I asked it was because because one of the findings from the distinct project was that, you know, people found it very difficult to to conceptualize. You know, some of the new technologies are new as are very new, as Ulf has, has said. Um, so I, I think it's it's much easier for people to to comprehend whenever they, they see them in action. And, um, you know, we, we showed some virtual reality demos that we had made um, for, for another project also. We, we, we made a, a demonstration of artificial intelligence, uh, very simple. And it, it was quite easy to do because, you know, we, we don't have, you know, uh, software developers in our team, but using existing tools, we were able to put uh, quite a good uh, demonstration together. Um, so that's the level of demonstration I mean. I don't mean the ones that that would be <clears throat> that you would use in a healthcare setting in an actual live environment. Of course, that's that's a totally different level. But I do think that it's important that even before you get to that stage, that that we show people who work in healthcare and in the public sector in general just you know what, what what the technology looks like and how easy it is to to do things with it thank you jose thank you Colin. alan uh, thank you jose i think to to build on what you were saying in the presentation and what colm was saying there is that there's there's two issues i think as you as colm said there the technology is um sparkling new out the box and I think the other issues brought up by your examples is that these enabling technologies could be focused at any sector and you need a way in which supply meets demand with the public sector. You can see where the priorities are, whether it's skills, whether it's service, and then see where these technologies can um, address these issues. But it's through collaboration that's needed that kind of sees what technology can do, but also, as Lee was saying, 
but it can actually have meaningful impact on the NHS and other public services and not just look good without actually either improving the quality of service, improving outcomes, improving staff satisfaction. There's got to be tangible benefits to these technologies that get seen in practice. Yeah, both both comments from, from Lee and from you are very, of course, very valid and actually they reflect part of the of the results or findings we got from interviews from from interviews we made with public sector uh, is sometimes it's difficult well there are a lot of challenges like lack of awareness but other times it's also to to how do you can get the buy in from from the public service uh, providers and they were saying that you have to show which problems these technologies are are are, are solving for for them so the yeah, very valid point, but I think I, I agree also that uh, with the comment from Lee that sometimes these projects can go, can it's impossible to go for the full solution, but can be a really good uh, project or a, a really good uh, way or instrument to, to test things that can go into something else. So this is, this is what I wanted to comment. Uh, Kirsty, I'm conscious about the time. I yes. don't know if we have time for a final reflection or a final question. We do. Oh. I, I've been told that uh, we're coming back to uh, the main session, I think three minutes after uh, the whole okay. hour. So uh, um, I'm keeping an eye on that. I also realized I started the session a little bit too early for uh, our YouTube colleagues. So I'm very sorry for everybody who sort of jumped into the session mid presentation that was my fault i was eager to get started um i actually have a question as well because we now talked about um um sort of some of the challenges and opportunities of, of these technologies for the public sector i was wondering if some of these lessons can also be transferred to the private sector and how to um, maybe introduce these kind of technologies to smes or help them how can basically NPA projects facilitate their transition to these new technologies. Is this, are there some lessons from your work or from anybody else in this session? How, how can we make that uptake better as well? Okay. Right, don't maybe, be an easy question. No, <laughs> no, 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 actually, actually, no, I, I have, I, I can intervene on this, but I, uh, I was waiting if somebody else wanted to intervene or, or, or to comment, not to be me, <laughs> that I'm the moderator and also talking, you know, but uh, all, very, very quickly. Um, the first example that Leah was, was showing my colleague is targeting SMEs. Um, basically what we are trying to do is to, to help SMEs in this case from traditional sector or from manufacturing sector to have access to technology. Uh, and the problem they have at the moment is that uh, technology or that knowledge is restricted in their area so using these technologies, we are allowing them. This is a project that is called, is, is made at a, a regional level. It's not in a European project, it's a regional level. And at the moment, what we are trying to do is to provide access to SMEs through uh, digital innovation hubs in their area to have access by using these technologies, by using these uh, guided tours to knowledge uh, in up to 14 uh, universities or, or research centers or IT colleges uh, where they can have access to a much wider range of, of solutions that in their own area. This is helping them to know what is going to be possible, to raise awareness about what is possible, and to start the journey from them to start to implement these solutions. So again, this is a, an approach that can be very valid if you target also the, the public sector. Very good. I can see that we're running now out of time, so I would like to wrap up with a final poll question, if I may. So we're going back to Slido. So we have a question. What do you think are the main challenges for the public sector not to adopt te disruptive technologies in service provision? Please rank them by putting the main challenges at the top. So this is a final poll question before we join the main session again. And in the meantime, I would like to thank all the speakers and Jose Manuel for moderating this quite brief discussion. I'm sure we will get back to this uh, when we launch the new program and start to wrap our brains around how to um, um, basically give life to the, the, the priority that we drafted because it's, it's not just us from the program who decide what's happening. 
I think it's very much in an dis open discussion with the stakeholders in the regions, uh, how best we can address this. I can see, uh, going back to the poll, that lack of awareness on solutions and their potential is one of the, is the, the biggest challenge here. And the next one is the skills gap in new technologies. Um, you know, you know, Kirsty, I think the results from this poll and also from the previous ones in the main session uh, is, is, is I'm very happy that because they go very well in line with also the results we got in the in the foresight analysis. Uh, so it seems like uh, the, the 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 replies uh, from from people or is well in, identified what, what are the issues because because they coincide almost hundred percent with what we got also from the interviews and the and the surveys we launched in the in the project. Yeah. I think it goes both ways as well. It's, you know, sometimes SMEs are not fully aware of the, the issues that are needing to be sought solutions for um, in the public sector. So I think having early discussions is the key with that. Fully agree. Yeah. 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 I can okay. see we're now in the last 40 seconds or so of the session, but I would like to thank you all for your participation and for an interesting discussion. And as I mentioned, we will no doubt come back to uh, to these issues. There's definitely scope for the future program to, to help address this. Thank you very thank, much. Everybody. Thank you everybody for the contributions. Yeah. See you in the main session. Much, folks. Um, Thank you for your comments. It was good. So you're all very welcome back to the model here in Sligo. Just again to to notify you that we are um, joined again by all of our other panelists here and all the other guests as well via Zoom, who are now back. Uh, with us here for today's NPA annual event. Um, just a quick practical piece of information. Ruth is going to just make a very quick visual summary of each of the discussions or really just kind of the key points from the other three uh, breakout sessions that took place. So you'll be able to catch up on some of those after today's event as well. Um, our next guest is joining us online via Zoom.